Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I'm going to be going through my design of a house refurb project. These plans are just from the planning portal in the UK. And if you ever want some extra practice or you're struggling to find some architectural drawings, you can just go on planning portal, find some drawings and just have a go at looking at the existing plans and the proposed plans and trying to make sense of it and see where new structure needs to go. So before I do any form of calculation, I'm going to be looking at the existing drawings and also the proposed drawings. I'm doing these markups on my iPad and I'm marking on the proposed structure. What I haven't shown on screen is that I'm actually looking at the existing drawing plans as well on my um, computer. Once I've worked out where the new structure is, that's when I can actually start doing the calculations and then putting sizes to those structural members. I'm going to be doing this video slightly differently. I've got this video set at 2 times x and I'm just going to let it play basically and I'll add commentary as and when I think it's necessary. I'm going to be leaving some chapter headings in the description so if you want to sort of scrub through the video feel free to go ahead. This video is actually going to be split into two parts just to make sure that it's not too long. Um, so I'll be releasing that next part next week. For those who are new to the channel and new to my videos, I do a lot of my structural markups and my calculations on my iPad directly. This markup is being done using the Concepts app on the iPad Pro and it's available for Android tablets, Windows and Mac. Now that I've worked out where the new structure is going to go, now I can actually do my calculations. Again, because the calculations are going to be fairly straightforward, I'm going to be doing them all by hand. And when I do these by hand, I'm going to be using GoodNotes 5 on the iPad. So whenever I start some new calculations, I always want to introduce the project, write out what the client is proposing, and kind of write out any sort of assumptions which I might have.
once I've introduced the project, the next thing I normally do is to work out the loadings which I'm going to be applying to the structure. I'm not going to be explaining how I derive these loads. I've done a load takedown video which kind of explains how to derive loads if you want to check that out. I'll leave a link in the description below. So before I design anything, I want to make sure that I set out exactly what I'm going to be designing. And that means labeling up a plan of the key structure items which I'm going to be designing. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a screenshot from the structural plan I'm doing and I've just copied it into the calculations. From the calculations, I'm going to be giving the structural items I'm going to be designing a reference. And what this does is it makes it really easy for anyone reading these calculations to understand what I'm designing and where I'm designing it. In my opinion, I think that's what differentiates a good calculations to a great set of calculations is just how easy it is to read and follow. I've been reviewing some calculations for a project which I'm doing in my main job and the calculations numbers wise is absolutely fine. However, the calcs are laid out so badly, it took me an absurd amount of time to try and work out exactly what they were designing or where they were designing it. As you do more and more projects, you'll find that the easier your calculations are to understand and read, the less queries you'll get from Psy or from Building Control. So it really pays dividends that you spend a little bit of extra time to make sure that your calculations are neat and tidy, easy to follow and easy to understand. Not only is it useful for external people, but for internal people as well. For bigger projects, or any project really, your calculations need to be checked and reviewed. If your calculations are easy to follow, then the review is going to be super easy and it's going to make their life so much easier. It's also great for self-checking your own calculations, which you definitely should be doing. If your calculations have been set out well and are easy to follow, then when you do your own self-check, you're going to understand exactly what you've done big projects as well, you know, you're going to be spending months and months on these calculations and sometimes you're going to forget what you've done three months ago. So if you've set it out properly and neatly, you're going to be able to understand your own work that much easier.
Okay now, so moving on to the actual design of the steel beams. Feel free to follow along and if you want a more detailed explanation on how to design a steel beam, I have a more detailed video on how to design a steel beam so I'll leave a link in the description below. As this beam is supporting existing masonry, I'm going to limit the deflection to either span over 500 or 5mm. In this case, span over 500 gives me 8mm limit, so I'm actually going to use a 5mm limit instead for the deflection. A deflection limit of 5mm is fairly conservative, however, if the design doesn't yield a ridiculously big beam, then I'm going to stick with it. I personally tend to err on a side of caution when it comes to supporting masonry. Because we know that the wall is a cavity wall, we want to provide two beams and tie them together so that one beam is supporting one skin of masonry each. Alternatively, you could provide a single UC section so that the wider flange can support both skins of masonry. However, a UC section is going to be much heavier on its own compared to separating it into two smaller UB sections. It's also going to be very hard to manual handle into a residential home so it's going to be a lot easier if you split them up into two smaller and lighter beams. Beam B is going to be very very similar except that the span is less and it's also not supporting a existing masonry wall. Therefore the deflection limits are going to be more standard. You may have noticed that I haven't checked the resistance for bending or the shear forces and it's simply based on my experience that I know for a simply supported beam supporting a UDL, shear force is never going to be critical and the design is going to be either governed by the bending moment or the deflection. It's a similar story when it comes to checking the bending moment resistance based on my experience because the beams are not that long in span. Even if the beams were laterally unrestrained, the beams would still be fine in bending moment. Therefore, I only check it for the deflection limits. However, if you are inexperienced with doing this and you haven't designed like a thousand steel beams, I would highly recommend you check the shear force and the bending moment capacities. Beam C again is going to be very very similar to beams A and B except that the span is even shorter than beam B. Because of the span and the loadings we can probably assume that we don't need a steel beam and that we can probably just spec a precast concrete lintel instead. It's always going to be good to provide a very cost effective solution to your client. A precast lintel is really really cheap compared to steel and you can get them really really easily from just like the local shop.
Specking a precast concrete lintel is really, really simple. All you've got to do is find a precast concrete lintel supply, and they will normally have these low span tables which you can use. Once you've found the right width of lintel, which in our case is going to be 100mm, we can use the load span table and compare the loads which we have calculated and work out which size lintel we need. I like to take a snapshot of the load span table and paste it into my calculations. From the calculations, I can then highlight the right lintel which I need to use. And that's it for the first part of this video. Please remember to like and subscribe to make sure that you get notified for when I upload the second part. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one.